Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 1244 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today, I'll be speaking with Melissa. She has a 12 year old son named Anthony who has type 1 diabetes, and she came on the show today because she feels like she might owe Anthony an apology. Please don't forget that nothing you hear on the Juice Box Podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your health care plan or becoming bold with insulin. When you place your first order for AG1 with my link, you'll get five free travel packs and a free year's supply of vitamin D. Drink AG1.com slash juice box. I know that Facebook has a bad reputation, but please give the private Facebook group for the Juice Box Podcast a healthy once over. Juice Box Podcast type 1 diabetes. If you're a U.S. resident who has type 1 diabetes or is the caregiver of someone with type 1 and a U.S. resident, please go to t1dexchange.org slash juicebox and complete the survey. When you finish the survey, you are helping to support type 1 diabetes research. t1dexchange.org slash juicebox. Thank you so much. This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries, Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Eversense. The Eversense CGM is more convenient, requiring only one sensor every six months. It offers more flexibility with its easy on, easy off smart transmitter and allows you to take a break when needed. EversenseCGM.com slash juicebox. Today's episode is sponsored by Medtronic Diabetes, a company that's bringing together people who are redefining what it means to live with diabetes. Later in this episode, I'll be speaking with Mark. He was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at 28. He's 47 now. He's going to tell you a little bit about his story. To hear more stories from the Medtronic Champion community or to share your own story, visit MedtronicDiabetes.com slash juice box and check out the Medtronic champion hashtag on social media. I'm Melissa. I am 43 years old and I'm a mom to two children. One of them, my son, he is 12 and he's a type one diabetic. Okay. So your son is 12. He's got type one. How old was he when he was diagnosed? He it was right after his 11th birthday. Oh, this is pretty recent then last year. So like a year and a half, it was eight. Um, he turned 11 in April, and then he was diagnosed May 2022. Was this yeah. a complete surprise, or is there a type 1 in your family? Complete surprise. Okay. had no idea. I think after listening to the podcast and hearing you talk to other people and ask them, like, do you have any autoimmune in your family? Like, I can go back to, like, my Nana, who always held her hands a kind of way and was like, my hands, and I can't, I don't have any tears, I can't cry, and they don't know what's wrong with me, like, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. My dad has type two okay. and he has very severe psoriasis, like kept him out of the army at the time, psoriasis. So there's definitely autoimmune in the family, but no type one. Wow. Yeah. You got it all figured. You found all of them. Like that was, yeah. it, was it interesting <laughs> for you to pick through and go, no tears. Hold on a second. And like, did you look into it? Did you go online? So I didn't. So, um, my Nana and I were not close. So at the time I just sort of like would roll my eyes at it. And it wasn't until hearing you say that, that I was like, Oh, wait a minute. That might've actually been a thing. Yeah. So and I just probably. sort of put it in the autoimmune basket. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know how it's probably something. I never know if I pronounce it right, but so sojourns, so sojourns, maybe S J O G R E N S. That's probably that. And I've never even heard of that. So I will. Oh, R A probably right. You're, you're describing with her hands. You think she might've had, like our like room yeah. Tourist, right yeah and that interesting yeah okay wow okay and uh, wait your father what war did it keep him out of no war he just wanted to join the army so he's an identical twin mm -hmm. and right after high school him and his twin brother were going to join the army and his brother who incidentally it's funny because they share all the same afflictions but he doesn't have psoriasis and so his my dad's psoriasis kept him out of the army, and my uncle went on to join the army. What year was that? Do you know, or like, like roughly? So, yep. So my dad graduated high school in 1977. He couldn't get in the army in 77 because of 
dry skin, it must have been insane. Yeah. Yeah. And he's gone through like, you know, different light treatments, different medications to try. And he has it for the most part under control. He's on, I think, Humira mm. for it. Mm-hmm. And and so he'll look at his skin and be like, oh, it's fine. I don't need this Humira anymore. And then he'll have a flare up. And I'm like, yeah, that's how you stay on the Humira. Yeah. 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 Well, that those injectables are are fairly new, but pretty impressive for what they accomplished mm-hmm. so far. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So your son is 12. He's had type one for a year. Why are you on the podcast? I just really looking back after his diagnosis, couldn't believe number one, how I gaslighted my own son. Like after his diagnosis, I'm divorced and I'm remarried and his father is also remarried. And it got to the point where I said for the four of us, like we owe this kid a collective apology because he has a little bit of anxiety and every symptom could be explained away by either a growth spurt or a little bit of anxiety. And so it was important for me to really apologize to him because he had said, I think something's wrong and maybe we should go to the doctor. And I'm like, Anthony, we've gone to the doctor about other things and you're fine. And I think it's a growth spurt or I think it's anxiety. I think it's this. And so really taking the time to be like, listen, we owe you an apology over the things that you said were happening to your body. And I essentially was like, ah, you're fine. And I also co-parent through diabetes with my ex-husband and his wife. And, you know, me and my husband are trying to figure it out our way. And you're talking about four very different personalities and how you manage diabetes with Mm. these four different personalities. Mm. A quick Google is anxiety autoimmune. An anxiety disorder can be caused by multiple factors such as genetics, environmental stressors, and medical conditions. New research also indicates that chronic anxiety symptoms that will not go away can be due to an autoimmune response triggered by common infections. I'm telling you, I am not a doctor. I'm not a researcher. I've been doing this podcast long enough. I don't think I've ever met somebody who has type 1 in their family who doesn't also start talking about, oh, my sister or her sister's very anxious or my aunt was or like, I, I don't know. Like it just... It feels hard to ignore to me, you, you know. That- I feel like that's totally reasonable. And my whole, like, there's a whole side of my family. I mean, we'll be joking, and I'm like, "Who's got the Ativan?" Because I don't have mine. <laughs> and we are. That's just how we are. Mm. Finally, this anxiety came through for your son, and it got. <laughs> and he was like, "No, I'm. I, I know something's wrong. Like, it's almost like." when people think someone's following them and then eventually they are, you're like, okay, your paranoia finally paid off. How long did that go on for? Were you just were like, nah, man, you're fine. If you take insulin or sulfonyl ureas, you are at risk for your blood sugar going too low. You need a safety net when it matters most. Be ready with Gvoke HypoPen. My daughter carries Gvoke HypoPen everywhere she goes because it's a ready-to-use rescue pen for treating very low blood sugar in people with diabetes ages 2 and above that I trust. Low blood sugar emergencies can happen unexpectedly, and they demand quick action. Luckily, Givo Kypopen can be administered in two simple steps, even by yourself in certain situations. Show those around you where you store Givo Kypopen and how to use it. They need to know how to use Givo Kypopen before an emergency situation happens. Learn more about why Givoke Hypopen is in Arden's Diabetes Toolkit at gvokeglucagon.com slash juicebox. Givoke shouldn't be used if you have a tumor in the gland on the top of your kidneys called a pheochromocytoma, or if you have a tumor in your pancreas called an insulinoma. Visit gvokeglucagon.com slash risk for safety information. Oh, just, it was probably only like a week or 10 days. Oh. Like it wasn't this epically long amount of time, but he would wake up and say, I peed the bed. And I would go into the bedroom and I'm like, your bed just isn't wet. So what I think is happening is like, you're starting to pee a little bit and you're waking yourself up and you're going to the bathroom. And I think you're probably sleeping through it because you're going through a growth spurt mm. and you just, it's fine. It's probably normal because you're not like wetting the bed and he, we would get in the car and he'd be like, well, I need to know how long this is going to take because I'm going to have to use the bathroom. Uh-huh. And I was like, buddy, this anxiety, like whatever you have, cause he hyper focuses on things. Right. 
And so you're like, you have now started focusing so much on needing to go to the bathroom that you're willing yourself to need to use the bathroom every 10 minutes. And he's like, no, my pancreas isn't working. <laughs> and he's like, so there's this other thing. And if you would just listen to me. Right. Well, also, he's 12. And- I've only met like four 12 year olds who've ever known anything reasonable. So, I mean, I, I listen, I think you're being hard on yourself saying you gaslit the kid, but I get your point. So. Well, I also wanted him to know, like, if there's something wrong, like I needed to do a better job of listening to him. Like if he. You definitely owed him an, an apology, <laughs> but, I don't, yeah. I don't, <laughs> but I don't think you were gaslighting him. I think you were just going through, you know, normal steps of, of problem solving and, you know, for a busy person and time and, you know what I mean? And, and all the other factors, given his anxiety and what you've seen in the past, it doesn't sound like you were just ignoring him. It just sounds like it took a took 10 days to get to it. That's not, I don't think that's bad. No. And I mean, thankfully, you know, he got, he had gone to dance, he dances and he had gone to dance and the dance teacher called me and was like, I think you should come pick him up. He's doing this weird kind of breathing. And thankfully I was working from home because I have a salon studio at home as well. So I ran out, I was working, I was able to just leave my client for two seconds, pick him up from dance, put him in the living room. And I said, I'm going to be right back. Finished up my client. And I went and we just looked at each other and he was breathing a little bit. And I just looked at him and I said, okay, I need you to go get a bag. We're going to the emergency room. And I looked at my husband and this is the weirdest thing. I looked at him and I said, he has diabetes and we have to go to the emergency room. How did you know that? I have no idea. Now you're just showing off. Melissa, you're just showing off now. Okay. I swear (laughs) to God. I said, I don't even know what makes me think this. There was a doctor's appointment like a couple of years before. And I was like, he's peeing a lot. Could it be diabetes? And they checked his sugar and they said, no, he's fine. And so I don't even know why it took me so long to get to the, he's peeing a lot. He has diabetes. But we just looked at each other and I said, go get in the car. And yeah, he has diabetes. Well, the peeing a lot thing. I mean, did your dad, did that, was that a thing that happened to your father with his type two? No. So my dad is, um, you know, an Irish Catholic stoic kind of man. And I don't know that I would, I think he lives with me now. So he's been living with me since June. So now I would pick up on different things, but my dad, he would just be like, ah, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. So I don't even know that I know leading up to it, what made him other than going to a routine appointment and them saying your A1C is high. How about that? Okay. All right. So yeah. you, pl- by the way, the Kusmal respiration is being picked up by a dance teacher. Well done. You, you know, whose husband is actually type one, but that's not what the she di- saw. She just saw, Hey, the kid's breathing weird. I don't want him dying. She here. Saw Come the, get him. Yes. Yeah. The, kid, the kid breathing weird and he's having a hard time catching his breath. He doesn't seem sick, but he's having a hard time catching his breath. I mm. think you should come get him. Wow. Okay. Well, so see you giving yourself a problem, but you figured it out in 10 days. His sugar wasn't even, he was in DKA, which was, you know, terrifying because we went to the doctor, we went to the emergency room and the doctor checked his sugar and everything started moving really fast. Like everything in the room just started moving really fast. And he came in and he said, um, we're, we called Boston med flight. And I was like, um, wait, I can't get on a helicopter. What? <laughs> and they said, no, 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 just the, just the ambulance. We need to, you to get in town because he, you know, he looked at Anthony, he was great with Anthony and he said, you are very sick and we can't take care of you here, but you're going to be okay. And they're going to take care of you in town. And I asked him to step out of the room. Um, and I said, I just, I don't understand what's happening because is he in danger? You said he's very sick. And the doctor said, you know, he's going to be okay, but you are about two days away from losing him. Wow. And okay. I just will never forget that moment. I thought like, it was like, how you see on the TV, like everything got black around me and everything was shrinking around me. So obviously that was a very life-changing day for all of us. And my ex-husband made it to the hospital before the ambulance. I was going to go on the ambulance, but my ex-husband made it. And I saw the look on my ex-husband's face and I just had to grab him and look at him and say, look at me, he's going to be okay. But there's that moment where we know nothing about diabetes, but we were just told we could have lost him in two days. Yeah. I remember being told that we did a good job getting to the hospital before Arden was in a coma. That didn't feel like I did a good job, by the way. It it felt, yeah, yeah. (laughs) And it's like, that's a sick to your stomach. Like the back of my jaw starts watering when I even tell this story, like sick to my stomach. 
Melissa, yeah. I've never heard anybody say the back of my jaw starts watering. Yeah, you get like juicy jaw <laughs> when you start thinking about things that make you feel sick. Melissa, you got to be real <laughs> careful. Your episode is going to be called Juicy Jaw. <laughs> you, got, you better say some pretty amazing in the next 45 minutes. <laughs> I need to come up with something else that cannot be titled. Yeah, so, yeah, trust me right every now. Every single person in my family will see that episode and they'll go, that's Melissa's. <laughs> I've never they heard that in my it, life. Like, Stop, I'm getting Juicy Jaw. <laughs> I got to be honest, just let it go. It's going to be called Juicy Jaw. <laughs> <laughs> so see, there's this thing in your note that I, I'm I'm super interested in talking about. So you said you're you're a small business owner. You're, you're a hairdresser, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you talked here about like just trying to keep your business going and, and dealing with all this after the diagnosis. And I don't think we talk about that stuff enough. So I was wondering if you would walk me through what happened and where the difficulties were. Being behind my chair, I've been doing hair for almost 24 years now. And I still I have very, very high client retention. Like I have my very first client still. And so I live my life like six weeks at a time, right? So any big major thing that happens in my life, I have to replay it with these people over and over and over again for up to six weeks because that's about the life cycle of somebody's hair Mm -hmm. and their appointments. So like I've had major traumas happen in my life. Like I had a brother who passed away just over four years ago. And so like the very first person that gets in my can, I'm like, oh, my brother passed away. And we have to go through that story every single time. So that happens. And I go back to work after the five days in the hospital and you're so new at this. Thank God for technology. But I have these numbers now coming across my watch. I, at the time, really have no idea what they mean because I found the podcast while we were in the hospital. But I haven't gone far enough in it. And, you know, like you say, that don't die advice is all that we're going on initially. So you're having doctor's appointment. I specifically went out and bought AirPods because I would pop these AirPods in behind my chair, do doctor's appointments, be talking to the school who at the time, that school didn't even have a nurse. I had to like go in and show them how to figure out his carb count. Mm. And so we would get calls at lunchtime. And all the while you're doing all these things And you're still trying to provide somebody with like a luxury service and be able to maintain the integrity of that appointment and the integrity of your business. Thankfully, I own my business with my best friend. So where if I fall down, she's able to pick up. And when she, something happens with her, I'm able to pick up where she's feeling like she's lacking. Right. So if he was sick, there were days that I had to call out and be like, I just need to be home with him. And thankfully I do have a salon suite at home. So I would have people come to the house as well. But there were there was a day where he was sick and I could not get his blood sugar down and the hospital was like, it's time to come in now. And so you're canceling clients, which I don't do. Like I very rarely, if do I get sick? Do I need a sick day? Do I take time off last minute? And it's really hard, especially when people are sitting in your chair. And I see this a lot in the Facebook group. People talking about like, oh, this person said I should take cinnamon and they will be very easily offended by someone and i know that people you intention matter right right like if you're well intended so for six weeks that we're going through anthony's diagnosis people would say oh i totally understand and i would say oh you do you totally understand and they would say oh my cat has diabetes (laughs) Ah, well yeah oh i don't know that if it's totally the same thing but they're well intended right so you try to very similar of course yeah (laughs) Yeah. did you ever (laughs) hug your ex at a hospital because that's how horrible your life was because i hadn't hugged him in a while before that and i had to like put my hands on him so i'm just gonna ask that maybe you understand it's not the same thing yeah so Uh, yeah was your cat life flighted anywhere by any chance (laughs) And like, I don't know that if something very traumatic happens to your cat, that I'm going to feel the same way as if it happens to my child. Yeah. That's, I mean, listen, I, I'm all for people loving their pets, but that's a weird, you know, a, a weird example to give somebody. But again, like you're saying, well-intended. Well-intended. And so when people talk to you and they say, oh, that's great. He's on a pump. So you don't have to worry about anything. And I think you can do two things. You can get upset about it and be like, you don't even understand. Or you can use that as an opportunity to speak back into somebody who maybe needs a shift in their thinking and needs more information. And then it's like a spider web and they can go out and be like, oh, I was wrong in my thinking. My hairdresser's son has diabetes and she told me X, Y, and Z. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a nice idea just to say, you know, well, actually, 
it eliminates her having to do injections, but, you know, it doesn't make the diabetes easier or less dangerous or, you know, impactful. Um, do you want to know more or is it, you know, have I have I bored you enough with the thing you heard that you thought was <laughs> was the truth? Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Can I ask this? You just talked about like people's life cycle of their hair being about six weeks. And you've been doing this for a very long time. But does that feeling ever go away when when a when a client walks out like, God, I hope they come back. If they don't come back, this all falls apart. If this falls apart, I can't pay my bills like that. That feeling that small business owners have. Did, have you lost that? You definitely know as a small business owner, like this is how much we need to pay the bills. But specifically as it pertains to doing hair, there are some people who you're like begging for them not to come back. <laughs> you are like, listen, we are not a good fit, right? Like if people say no hairdresser has ever been able to get my hair right, the chances of me doing it right are very slim. Mm. Feels and like you might be the problem. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah. the common denominator here is not me. Right. And you, there are some people and you look at it like every time someone leaves, you get a new person that you might be better situated to work with. Um, but there's definitely that fear, especially in with now within post COVID when we had supply chain issues and inflation and issues like that, like, no, 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 we need to hold on to every single person and they need to keep their appointments and we need to make sure that we can maintain the business. Yeah. But I think that because we are a small business and we put family first, it's like, listen, we're doing the best we can and we put the good energy out into the world and hopefully we just can make enough to maintain the business and have our income be what it needs to be. Mm. And we just want to do as best we can for our clients. And I think at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, no, I just, I recognized my own life and what you were saying, because, you know, aside from making the podcast and it being a, this valuable thing for people. So it's obviously something that you want to keep doing for those of you who aren't lucky enough to be in a position like this, like helping people, like actually helping them is, is incredibly fulfilling. And so like, just from that perspective, I don't want this to stop, but I am also like, you know, I'm a, I'm a person, I have a family and, and I need to, I have bills like to pay. And so from a professional point, I don't want this to stop either. And, you know, so while your things felt like to me, like it's on a, like a six week clock, I'm on this crazy clock where January 1st comes and I am on a mad tear to provide good content, stuff that helps people, you know, that keep it entertaining, stay ahead of other content providers as far as, you know, like, you know, new ideas. And like, you know, you're constantly you're striving to put out stuff that people want to hear that will actually help them. Like, that's my mix. I, I want I want it to be entertaining and I want it to be valuable. Yeah. And we do definitely the same thing behind the chair. We want to provide an environment like we keep it very light at the salon. Like it's very fun. It's a fun environment. We're making sure actually my business partner and I also educate for the color company that we use at the salon. So we try to, you know, stay as current as we possibly can. We try to give these clients really an experience that they know that they're valued, but we also value their time. Mm -hmm. So if we can get them in and out as fast as possible, some people want to stay with us all day and that's great. And that's the best. But it's also trying to find that balance. Like there was a time when it was like, no, 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 my clients first, my clients first. And I've definitely had to shift gears because my clients were providing my income. And I've had to shift gears and say, I need to put my family first. And hopefully I can strike that balance yeah. that I really need. And it's, it's hard. And I think, you know, when you and I were speaking earlier, it is hard because you pour so much of yourself into it. That if something doesn't work out, it's hard not to take it so personally right? and take it personally from the business perspective as well. Yeah. And then, you know, right after diagnosis, my poor clients are sitting there and I'm trying to provide them. And I love what I do. I really love what I do. And there's alarms going off. And one of the girls in the salon is like, is he high or low? And we're running to find my phone to figure out what's going on. <laughs> this is just not how it's supposed to go. But it's just the way it's going to go. Right. And so you're trying to provide... This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by the only CGM you can take off to get into the shower. The Eversense CGM. EversenseCGM.com slash juice box. Well, I mean, sure, you could take the other ones off, but then you'd waste a sensor and have to start over again. But not with Eversense. Eversense is a six-month wear implantable CGM. So if you want to take a shower without anything hanging on you, pop off the transmitter, jump in the shower, when you get back out, 
put it back on, and you're right back to where you started. Come to think of it, you could do that whenever you wanted to. Maybe it was your prom night or your wedding day. Maybe you just don't want the thing on for a little while, but you don't want to go all through the hassle of taking it off and having to restart it and, you know, starting back over with like wonky numbers and having to, you know, all that that goes with it when you take off a CGM and put it back on. Oh, but you don't have to do that with the Eversense CGM because Eversense is the only long-term CGM with six months of real-time glucose readings. This gives you more confidence, more convenience, and flexibility. The Eversense CGM is there for you when you want discretion, a break, or maybe just a little adult time. EversenseCGM.com slash juice box. Pop that transmitter off, pop it back on, you're right back where you started, without any wasted devices or time. Right now, we're going to hear from a member of the Medtronic Champion community. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Medtronic Diabetes. And this is Mark. I used injections for about six months, and then my endocrinologist in the Navy recommended a pump. How long had you been in the Navy? Eight years up to that point. I've interviewed a number of people who have been diagnosed during service, and most of the time they're discharged. What happened to you? I was medically discharged, yeah, six months after my diagnosis. Was it your goal to stay in the Navy for your whole life, your career? It was, yeah, yeah. In fact, I think a a few months before my diagnosis, uh, my wife and I had that discussion about you know, staying in for the long term. And, you know, we'd made the decision despite all the hardships and time away from home. That was what we loved the most. Was the Navy like a lifetime goal of yours? Lifetime goal. I mean, as my earliest childhood memories were flying, being a fighter pilot. How did your diagnosis impact your lifelong dream? It was devastating. Everything I had done in life, everything I'd worked up to up to that point was just taken away in an instant. I was not prepared for that at all. What does your support system look like? Friends, your family, caregivers, you know, for me, the Medtronic Champions community, you know, all those resources that are out there help guide the way, but then help keep abreast on, you know, the new things that are coming down the the pipe and to give you hope for eventually that we can find a cure. You can hear more stories from Medtronic Champions and share your own story at MedtronicDiabetes.com slash juice box. An experience and a good haircut and at value so that people come back. My thing is I'm basically piling up downloads, listens, right? Like I need a certain amount of listens in a bucket by July to entice the advertisers to have a conversation in October about coming back for the next year. So the first six months are just like a mad dash to to make downloads. And then it turns into a sales thing. And then after the sales thing, then it turns into a negotiation. And then, you, and then they, they re-sign up, and then that was the half. The la- and by the way, and while I'm doing that for the last half of the year, I'm also still providing content. And like, I'm, it, like that part didn't change. I'm just, now I have two jobs. And then finally, I mean, it's November 29th. You and I are talking right now. And I'm still waiting on, I'm still waiting on two confirmations for advertisers for next year. And if mm-hmm. they, like, for some reason don't come back, then... The other advertisers will think, well, where did they go? How come they don't want to advertise on that show anymore? And then it starts. Now, next year, I'm like, well, this is it. This is the last year of the podcast. Like, you have no idea how many times I've thought, this is the last year of the podcast. I can't keep this going anymore. That's it. It's not just up to me. Just making good content's not enough. Like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And and for me, my hairdresser, like clients, their hair stops growing, some of them. So some people just love the podcast. They listen to it constantly, which... God bless them and thank you very much for listening. But some people are just here for management and then they get their management in order and they go, oh, I don't need that podcast anymore. And now I did all that work to find that person and now they're gone. And so like the reason I brought all that up is because it so resonated with me when you said, I don't get sick. I don't have time to be sick. (laughs) I, I, I feel the same way. I'm like, I don't know how people who don't work for somebody else even like, I, you know, I've heard people say it over the years, like, I don't get sick days. I work for myself is a is a pretty like surface way of saying it. But the real truth is, is there's no one else. There's no one else keeping this ship up. Like I do it or it doesn't happen. And it's a, and it's panic. It's like panic inducing. Constantly. You know, when it's my my husband would be like, oh, I'm taking this day off. And I'm like, oh, that must be nice. <laughs> Let me know how you enjoy your nice day. Yeah. And if I have a client cancel, I'm like, oh, well. Do I need an OnlyFans now? Like, what am I going to (laughs) do? How do my feet look? 
<laughs> like, like, yeah. I have really nice feet, guys. I think I could make some money off of this. But it's just like really hard not to be like self deprecating, self loading. Like, you know, you lose a client. Like, everybody hates me. Mm-hmm. I'm never going to be able to provide for my family. What am I going to do? It's very hard. You're going to hear eight to 10 episodes. You've already heard them now because of the way the recordings go, but you'll, you've heard eight to 10 episodes of me recording with COVID, like, like sitting here, like falling apart like sweating with a fever, making this podcast, you will never know. You have Mm -hmm. heard this podcast recorded while I have bronchitis. You've heard this podcast recorded while my mom was literally dying. Like you've heard this podcast recorded while I was so worried about my children that I thought I was going to go crazy while my wife was sick and I was sick to my stomach. Like you're never going to know that. And these are situations where most people would go, I'm going to take a day off today. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. But my point is that we never talk about this so much. And listen, even if you work for somebody else, that comes with its own problems. Now you're taking time off. All the, hey, my kid's blood sugar. I'm learning about diabetes. I don't know what to do. You hear people say all the time, I had to quit my job when my kid was diagnosed. Like, you know, because my they were going to fire me because I couldn't come in and I wasn't figuring it out in time. In a weird way or lucky, you at least could turn to your person and say, look, you know me, I'm going to do a good job cutting your hair, but you got to give me 10 minutes here, you know, so. Oh, absolutely. And I'll go in the back room and mix color and there'll be tears coming down my my eyes, coming down my face Mm. because you try and hold it together. I mean, I've been doing this so long. I went through my divorce. I went through my brother dying. I went through my grandmother dying. I went through Anthony's diagnosis. And the beauty of this is that in my specific situation, I do life with these people, right? Like some of these people have been coming to me literally for 24 years. I've seen them through marriages, divorces, kids, sickness, happiness. I've seen them through. So we are essentially doing life together. And so sometimes if, you know, it's a particularly hard blood sugar day and I can't get him off the roller coaster, I will put the phone on speaker and put it on my station. And there, my clients are like, Hey, Anthony, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm, very thankful and very lucky for that in that situation. But even some of my clients who are nurse practitioners were like, you know, Melissa, this would warrant like a leave of absence. And I said, that's great. Should I start a, like a GoFundMe? Yeah. Pay my bills? I'll, go, I'll, go, I'll go tell the lady that runs the place, <laughs> see if she's up for, flo- oh, wait a minute. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. So, you know, you, you are doing life with these people, but also sometimes like The self-care of this particular, and everything's hard, right? Like life is just hard and I understand that, but this particular disease for me as the caretaker is like the, you know, at the helm of the ship, it requires, okay, what do I need to do on the back end to stay okay, to be able to give him what he needs and be able to give the clients what they need. And for me, it's making sure like I make it to the gym every single day. Like if I never lose another pound in my whole entire life, that's fine. It just, for the mental health clarity, I need that hour. Mm -hmm. But what can I do to make sure I stay okay for my clients, for my kids, for my family? Isn't it strange that when you work hard in life, you have these kind of conversations and you're just like, oh my God, like I'm on the edge every day. Like, I think most people are walking around just holding a murderous rage under the surface. You know what I mean? Like, just like everything's wrong. Like, you know, we always ask people, how are you? How are you? I think we should have a month where everybody answers honestly. <laughs> oh my gosh. We were talking about this the other day. It's like, how are you? It's like, I don't, well, which answer is it you're looking for? Yeah. Do you just want me to say, okay? Because if that's, if you want me to say, okay, then I'm okay. Yeah. But I have a whole plethora waiting. If you want me to unload. How are you? You should just change to, I hope you're doing well, because that's what you mean. <laughs> that's what you mean. Yeah. Hey, I hope you're doing well. Because how are you is either, like you said, like you're going to, I'm going to lie to you or I'm going to tell you a story that's going to, you know, shrink your balls to the size of raisins and you're just going to (laughs) walk around in a scared little huddle. That's a line from a Julia Roberts movie. Which one? Notting Hill. Have you ever seen Notting Hill? I I don't, I don't know if that's one I've seen. All right. So Hugh Grant's flatmate, look at me being British, flatmate. (laughs) says something like, I'm going to tell you a story that'll shrink your balls to the size of raisins. That's always stuck in my head for like 20 years. <laughs> I've never said it on the podcast where I'm like, finally, and get this one out. But, but you know, like, like you're either going to be horrified by my answer or, or I'm going to lie to you or my life is going great. And somehow those people whose lives are so easy, their lives just become bad in a different way. Well, everybody has their thing, right? Yeah, like yeah. every, no one's getting out of this life unscathed. Right. And everyone has their thing. And I think when you say like, when someone says, how are you? And you say, I'm okay. Well, 
for the most part, mostly you just are okay. Like it might be, it might feel yeah. terrible, but like you are okay. You really are. Yeah. I mean, that's the other side of it is that this is like, I, and I think that's important. It's why I brought it up actually. Like you, you're, you're, you're digging into my, into how I'm thinking about this episode, but you are okay. Like, right. Like that is the truth. Like, yeah, that all this stuff is going on. I don't know about my diabetes and I don't understand this and I can't pay for that and blah, blah, blah. But every day you're up and it's happening. It's not, it's not ideal. And it's not certainly how you would choose for it to be, but it also isn't a thing that you should run around just going like, oh my God, everything's ruined. You know what I mean? Like it just, it's your, you hear people say like, this is my new normal. I guess that is the best way to say it. Like I'm okay. Like I'm fine. I have concern. I have a whiteboard in front of me. That's just about my family's health. Ask about this for Cole. See if this vitamin will help Arden. Try this for Kelly. We need to get this test. There has to be a doctor's appointment here. I don't even see that anymore as like upsetting. It just, it just is what it is. A hundred percent. It just is. And my days go by very quickly, Melissa. So that's nice. <laughs> I'm never bored. <laughs> there's never, there's no time to be bored. Oh yeah. I don't understand when people are bored. I don't understand when people watch television. I'm like, how do you do that? <laughs> that's fantastic. Like I'm making the, somebody said to me the other, oh, what was it? Cole's girlfriend was here for, for Thanksgiving. And it was late one night and she's like, can we watch a movie? I really want to watch this movie. And she's, I'm like, sure. She goes, can we watch American Gangster? Like it's a Denzel Washington movie with Russell Crowe. And uh, she's like, yeah, I just saw this documentary about it. I want to see the movie now. So we put the movie on and I'm watching. I'm like, boy, it's a good movie. And about 45 minutes in, I'm like, I, God damn it. I feel like I've seen this movie before, but I've never seen it. And then I realized I once put it on a monitor next to me while I was working on the website for the podcast. I have technically sat through the movie, but I've never sat and watched it. And like, that's even how I get my entertainment, like while I'm doing something else and to, so that I can make a podcast. And then, you know, Melissa and I were talking before the show started and uh, before we started recording and I told her, it's like, it's such a weird thing to help people, to know you're helping so many people and yet still have to go online and get yelled at sometimes. And you're just like, I'm just trying to help. <laughs> like, and like that's like one of the things you want to tell people like while you're yelling at me please remember that i don't even watch television with my eyes because i'm busy doing this for you and somebody might hear that and go i'm not asking you to do it i'm like fair enough like but yep you know yep. like okay so like i don't i'm not offended by it i'm like whatever be mad at me if you want to be mad at me or i don't care i'm just going to take this thing i'm going to put it out in the world you can do whatever you want with it Yep, and we're just going to do the best we can. Yeah, and we're all going to do the best we can. But the truth is, you are, I mean, listen, there are some people who are in obviously dire situations, and I'm certainly not lumping them in with everybody else. But for the most part, you are okay. Your mm -hmm. life sometimes is just what you decide it is, if that makes sense, you know? And there are things that, like, especially in the situations where we can control, even if diabetes, like, diabetes is one of those things where... I'm very type A. I like right and wrong. I like, here's, this is black and white. So diabetes came in and I was like, well, this is the best because it does not follow a lot of rules all the time. And what you have taught me is, you know what? It doesn't even matter why. Like the why just doesn't matter. But we can have a situation come up and it's like, fine, but it's still okay. We can still adjust. We can make adjustments. We can do more insulin. We can treat a low and it's still going to be okay. We've been here before. We've seen this before. Obviously, if your kids get sick, if they get stomach bugs and things take a turn that's different. But for the most part, if we've been here before, it'll be okay. Yeah. No, it's such a, I mean, it is a thing I probably used to say on the podcast more than I do now. But yeah, sometimes your blood sugar is high. Like, it would be great to know why. And long term, we do want to figure it out so that you can get ahead of it. But in the moment that people make themselves crazy sometimes trying to figure out what happened instead of trying to fix what happened. If that makes sense. You know, see, so you get kind of, uh, what, what is that? They call that analysis of per, wait, wait, paralysis of analysis. Like, is that the saying? It is the saying. I don't know a lot of sayings, but um, no, it's a, yeah, it is. Cause I get it when I go to like, look things up. If I'm like, Oh, I want to go here. And I look it up. I'm like five minutes. And I'm like, I have no idea what just happened. I got to shut this computer and move on. Mm -hmm. I'll have to come back to yeah. this. Blood sugar is high. Let's bowl us. You know, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll figure out what happened later. I don't want you to ignore for the rest of your life that the fat in your meal makes your blood sugar rise 90 minutes after you eat or something like that. But like in that moment, we want to get it down. I saw a person doing it online last night. Kids, blood sugars like in the 400s. 
something obviously went wrong. I've changed the pump and I bolused again. And I'm like, okay, but it's not moving. So I said, maybe you should inject some insulin. But mm-hmm. I already bolused through the pump. I was like, yeah, but the blood sugar is 400. Like, right. is there not a small amount of insulin you could use here just to test the idea of it? Maybe there's something wrong with your pump site or, you know, blah, 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 whatever. And you could just see the person frozen. Even in writing, they're like, well, I don't know what to do now. And they sat and watched that blood sugar for hours. And it's funny that you should bring that up. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to no, talk to you. No, go, please. So, you know, as I was saying about how we co-parent. So Anthony was with his dad last night and it's hard because, again, intention matters. My ex-husband, there's no question about how much he cares about his children. He's well-intended, but it's hard. You have to learn to kind of sit back and be like, okay, he has the same information that I have. And I've tried to tell him, like, listen, at this mark, if we have pizza, here's where everything is going to start to get a little wonky and you might have to hit it a little bit harder. And on those nights where it's like, oh, he just had pizza and you're watching from a different house but you kind of can't say anything because you've already said it. And he has to parent also and figure out how to navigate diabetes also on his own. And he has access to the same information that I have access to. It's a hard thing to watch because you know, he's frustrated or Anthony's going to be frustrated that these things are happening. And it's like, oh, I think we already talked about this. And it's hard to co-parent through those situations. Like you're saying you're online and you're like, well, what about this? And you saw them freeze. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. I've done a number of interviews about this. I don't know that I've ever come to a, a helpful conclusion. The idea of uh, the dissolution of a, of a relationship, a marriage that then has to come back together again and then be decision makers together when like, let's be honest, like one of the main reasons why people do break up in a relationship is because they can't come to an agreement on anything. So now, now you make it like my wife and I are still married and we had trouble agreeing about how to manage diabetes when Arden was first diagnosed. I don't know what you're supposed to do when you're watching that CGM and somebody's somewhere else and you think, I know what to do. I know what, I know what will help here, but that is not a person I can communicate that to. And at the same time, if I don't, then my kids in this situation, it, feel, it must, it's like, it feels like a, probably an ultimate rock in a hard place. Oh, yeah. I mean, because if I speak to my husband and he's somewhere with Anthony and he doesn't do something, I will literally call him and be like, are you new? Are you a tourist? What are you doing that you're not addressing what's happening right now? And (laughs) I can't call my ex-husband and be like, hi, what are we doing? You know, I and I can say the things to my husband, but I can't say it to my ex-husband. And so I just sit there and like (laughs) pace around the house. Isn't, and, isn't it funny? Uh, <laughs> it's hilarious. Are you new? And, What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> Is this your first day? Yeah. Do we not talk about diabetes all day, every day? I mean, and we don't, you know, but him, I'll be like, oh, I tried this, you know, with my husband, oh, I tried this, you know, new bolusing strategy. And so him and I are always talking back and forth. And my ex-husband is a very smart man, but he's somebody who he hears a piece of information. And the first piece of information is the information we take on. So learning new information is harder because he heard something, and especially when we heard it from the hospital. Mm -hmm. So when we heard from the hospital, 15 carbs, 15 minutes, that's it. That's the piece he's holding on to. Rest of our life, we're doing that. Yeah. That's what we're doing. And so if I see an 80 blood sugar and at home, I would be like, everybody hold, don't move. It's fine. (laughs) My ex-husband's like 15 carbs, 15 minutes. And then we're staring at 200. I'm shooting for 80. <laughs> like, I don't know what everyone right. else is talking about, but okay. Right. But again, you've just completely blown up my brain because now I realize that my wife is looking at me thinking, oh my God, you freaking idiot. But she's not saying it out loud because we're still together. Is that actually what's happening? <laughs> no, not for me. I tell my husband he's a freaking idiot. Oh, okay. <laughs> and they all tell, like, I have an easy time doing that with him because also, my husband is like my best friend, right? So he's a safe place for me. So I can unload on him and he can be like, I love you so much. He'll look at me and say, I love you so much. I'm like, I totally didn't deserve that, but okay. But he's like <laughs> a safe place for me to land, <laughs> you know? There's the thing that nobody tells you when you're getting married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That poor guy, when we go into the, like, if 
you know how you go to the doctor and they're like, are you safe at home? I'm like, I mean, I'm fine. I would check on Billy, but I'm fine. <laughs> He's probably not safe, but I'm doing absolutely terrific. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm yeah. doing great. Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. check on him, though. Yeah, that, that poor guy's <laughs> holding on by a thread. I am pretty yeah, terrible yeah, yeah. to him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's okay. He loves me. <laughs> Yeah, he just knows I have anxiety, and he's like, yeah, here it comes. Lay it on me. <laughs> yeah. No, I think people end up doing that for each other, but it's just lovely. But, yeah, that, that bit about working in a, you know, an, an X situation, I don't know. Like, there I, there have been some people who have come on who have swallowed, like, really hard and let it all go. And they actually describe that their life is better, that they're not mad with their ex anymore, but they had to stop being mad to help the kid. But, it, you know what I mean? It almost helped them. But that's a thing that if both people aren't on board, it's hard. Then, you know, one person's the punching bag and one person's the hand. If only one person decides, I'm just going to let this all go. But somebody has to, right? Yeah. And I mean, I'm a child of divorce. So there are things that I was like unwilling to repeat with my children. Mm -hmm. So like we will do birthday parties together. You will see pictures of just me and my ex-husband and my kids. And you will see pictures of all six of us. Because I don't have that from growing up. And there are things that I just think make kids feel so much more secure. Yeah. And so there is some things that like I might swallow something. And I'm sure my ex-husband has to do things that he doesn't love doing as it pertains to me or my ideas about something. But I do think, especially where it pertains to diabetes, there's always the helm of the ship. And there's always going to be one person at the forefront of somebody's care, whether you're caring for an elderly person, whether you're caring for a sibling, there's always somebody that's, you know, doing just a little bit more research or whatever. So I am able to talk to him and say, and I've, you know, suggested the podcast, hey, this podcast episode, or I found this article, or hey, I tried this dosing strategy. And at least I know I said it, whether he is like, ah, I don't want to talk to her today and doesn't take it in. At least I know I said it. And a lot of most of the times he's available to hear it. Yeah. And without any ego. Being solid is such a big part of being a good parent. Like just being solid and stable and somebody that you can count on to do the thing. That, that you know whatever the thing is, like when your kids know you're there, I think that's so big. Like you know when I they yeah, you know, when something yeah. happens and they're like that lady's going to take care of this, I know she will. Like, like, I just, I don't have to worry about that. They handle that. I don't mean like, I don't mean you running around cleaning up after them or something like that. I mean the big right. stuff, like, you know, like shit sideways, I'm going to look up and you know, who's going to be there. Mom's going to be there. And, right. and like, I know that's going to happen. I think that it creates a comfort in a human being while they're growing and maturing. That is, it's irreplaceable as, as, um, as a valuable ingredient in their life. So even just you reaching out to an ex and saying, look, this is a thing you should know. Maybe you're not going to respond to me or whatever. I, I don't care. I'm still doing the right thing in this situation. And the right thing is to give you this piece of information. Like I, that's a really big deal and very mature of you. And I think it, it matters so much for them, for the kids, because then they also will not be as afraid to have certain communications and certain conversations if they right. know that both parents are on the same page. You're also not, I want to be clear. I, I'm not getting any vibe from you that your ex is some bad guy or anything like that. Like I don't get that no, vibe no, 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 at all. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, obviously he's my ex for a reason. Um, his ex for a reason. I don't think that both of us, you know, I don't think either one of us have a lot of bad things to say about each other, but I don't, I think that both of us know that the path that we're on now is better than probably it would have been if we stayed. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I think that he's very happy in his marriage. I'm very happy in my marriage. And I think we're doing the best we can for our kids. I mean, I'm, I'm giving them just enough trauma to like keep them funny. Um, <laughs> <Perfect. but laughs> just enough Boston to make them decent people. <laughs> just enough. <laughs> Fantastic. So yeah, I think that we, you know, we are definitely exes for a reason, but yeah. I, you know, one of the things is I would never question how much he cares about his children, things like that. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, it, it all sounds very, very good to me. Um, hey, just real quickly, I love that the Patriots suck. I just want to say that. <laughs> I don't. Care. Why I don't did you have care. to cut so deep <laughs> just then? Like, even, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't even care if you like football or not. I just want to say out loud that I'm thrilled that they suck this season. <laughs> Can I just tell you that when I was growing up, it was a terrible era for the Patriots, and I remember 
my dad, I think where I think the total was like seven windshields because he would be driving and he would just like pop the windshield when they were screwing up, <laughs> like spider cracks across the windshield. There was one time we were sitting in the living room watching the Patriots and he was so mad. He ran up, pulled the cable box out of the wall, sent it sailing to the living room out a closed window. <laughs> so like, how's your anger management as it pertains to the Patriots? I remember exactly where I was in 2001. When they, I think, I believe it was, I think I was 21, um, when they won their first Super Bowl mm-hmm. with Tom Brady. And then this dynasty is so amazing. And now, if you, I listen to um, sports radio every morning, if you could hear the way they're talking, it's like, it is unbelievable to hear how heartbroken, how mad everybody is. Yeah. It's like we're just walking around in like mourning because we lost Tom Brady. And I don't know, we are a disaster right now just a disaster. It's an interesting thing how a sports franchise can impact uh, an entire city. It's it's yeah. really fascinating. Like I remember when the Phillies were in the World Series role in 2 years ago when they actually made it to the World Series, but the run up to it, the closer they got to being in the World Series, you could watch crime in Philadelphia fall. Isn't that crazy? People were just happier. They were happier and less likely to like take that murderous rage that I talked about earlier and go let it out somewhere. They were letting it out through happiness, through watching baseball on television. Fantastic. I'm always surprised at how quickly people turn oh, yeah. on their team. Like <laughs> It is wild to me how quickly they turn. They want this one fired. That one's got to go. And it's very quickly. It, it happens very quickly. Yeah. That's really something else. Like I just, just wonderful. I don't know. I'm not an aficionado, obviously. Like, I don't know everything about football. But with a little bit of hindsight here, it just seems like it wasn't Belichick. It wasn't the system. It wasn't the Patriots. It was that guy. Like, there was something about it was, yeah, that guy. It was him. Yeah. I mean, I think it's easy to say, like, the coach is great when your players are great. I think that, that don't get me wrong. Like, I don't want to get land based for saying, I think Bill Belichick's great. But I think the guy, it makes it easy when the guy's really great too, right? Yeah. And a lot of the assistants went other places and they're not doing well as head coaches either. Right, right. And actually my husband's going to the game this Sunday and I was I was surprised that we're going to waste money on tickets for him to go this weekend. Well, the tickets must be $8 at this point. Does anybody even want to go? They're actually not that <laughs> expensive. And I was like, well, I guess if you're going to go, at least you're not going to spend like $15,000 before you've even left the house. Yeah. No just kidding. on tickets, you know. Anyway, my favorite Patriot story is Really, at the top one is, do you remember when the owner stopped to get a handy in Florida on his way to the Super Bowl? <laughs> of all the stories, that one's your favorite? It's my absolute favorite. <laughs> <laughs> he got on a private jet, flew to Florida to a massage parlor to get a I tug, know. and then went out to the Super Bowl. <laughs> did you just say to get a tug? I did. Is that not appropriate? <laughs> No, it's hysterical. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's my favorite. No, it's, it's my good. favorite. It's my favorite Patriot story. Like, like I. Oh, it's just like, could you not have figured out a way to be a little bit more discreet and not end up on the news? Like, whatever. If you yeah. Need to go get a touch. Yeah. If you're go taking, ahead. if like, you're taking we... a jet, somebody's gonna notice. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> why did he go to Florida? But wasn't it Arizona? Like, why did he go to Florida before he went out west? Like, that's weird. <laughs> that has to be a world class tug. Uh, well. <laughs> You know what, Melissa, you're saying the truth here because you'd think that a wealthy man could find that at the Super Bowl because, I mean, we all know, right, like prostitutes flood the Super Bowl cities the weekend of the Super Bowl. Like it's a major. I mean, everybody has to make their money, right? (laughs) Yeah, well, you go where the work is, is what I'm saying. But (laughs) listen, if people stop coming to your haircuts, you start going to them, I guarantee it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah a, and i like i mean like i said am i gonna have to start an only fans <laughs> you know we gotta do what we gotta do <laughs> anyway that was a news story i'm not making that up you can go google it and look it absolutely no, yeah, happened. that was a legit news story we yeah. all hung our heads and thought you couldn't have figured out how to be more discreet about that also he's married right i don't know if at the time if she had because he was married and then she passed away and I'm not sure of the timeline on that. I guess I'm just trying to say that if I was married to a man that wealthy, and even if I didn't want to talk to him anymore, I still think if he was like, hey, you know, I'd be like, all right. <laughs> I do love my Mercedes. Like, Come here. 
<laughs> you know, when people say like money won't make you happy, like, well, I, can I try? Yeah. <laughs> like, can I can I give it a try? I'm like, you know. I mean, did they hate each other? <laughs> like, wear one of those gloves when you do the food prep. I don't know what to say. I first of all, I've never. I want to be honest. I've I've never done that for another man, so I don't know the implications of it. <laughs> but <laughs> I might be talking out of my ass right now. I'm just saying, like, to be wealthy, I think I could do it. Is what I'm getting at. <laughs> I love when people say money won't solve my problems. I'm like, 99 percent of them. I think, they, yeah, I think let's, it might. Yeah, let's try and see what happens. Like, <laughs> what if it did? You know? Yeah. Anyway, that took an odd turn, but I don't think really because you're from Boston, and honestly, this is how you want to be talking. <laughs> no, my not really, but my clients also know that I am like a wide open book, and yeah. I think in just in Boston, we're just built a little differently. No, I, I think there's a lot of similarities between Boston and Philadelphia, where I grew up too. Like just the very like I I'm watching like people. The better the Eagles get right now, the more people around the country are trashing the fans. But I'm going to tell you something. If you lived here, you would love it. You would think it was the it was the greatest thing. Like just nothing better. My example of that would be that when Bryce Harper played baseball in Washington, I was like, what an asshole. And like when um, what's his name went after him and choked him in the dugout, I was so like, oh my god, that's hilarious. What was that? Papelbaum. Do you do you know about this? Do you ever seen that video? Oh, you, it, I, I feel it's ringing a bell, but I can't say for sure that I know exactly. Bryce Harper's a young kind of brash guy. He must have said something that made one of the crazy players out of his mind. The guy came down the steps of the dugout, leaped at him, put his hands around his neck and jacked him up against the back of the dugout. And I was like, Harper's getting his Bryce Harper plays in Philly right now. I'd go defend his home for him if he needed me to. It's so much. <laughs> it's so much fun when they're on your side. Like that's the yeah, and those like yeah. deep rivalries, like the the deep love that these people have for certain teams, like New England, the way they love their Patriots, a hundred percent. Yeah, they would defend everything for them until they start screwing up. Like you know, people think that our quarterback is doing a great job, and now they're ready to like you know burn him at the stake. In the end, you're you're getting out. I mean, listen, life. I, I, I keep going back this year to something my son said to me. He's, he was on his own for about six months, maybe, when he called me one day, very super serious. And he said, I need to ask you a question. What do people do after work? And I, I found it to be such a sad thing because I was like, oh, he's an mm-hmm. adult now. Like, he doesn't have baseball to go to. He doesn't have this. Like, he's, he's, like, he's like, what do people do? And w- when there's a whole world out there beating their ass into the ground doing their job, and, 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 you know, that's true because I make a podcast and it's incredibly difficult and I have something to compare it to. I used to work in a sheet metal shop and not for a day, for a long time. I'm telling you, I'm not dirty and I'm not hot, but this is difficult. And so everyone out there is doing something difficult, right? And they don't mm-hmm. have enough money and their kids have diabetes or something else is going on or Jesus, like, you know, how about they just got psoriasis all over them and the goddamn fucking Patriots can't win. You, you know what I mean? Like, Imagine like, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And like, like that feeling, like everyone's got that going on. And then if you get a good sports team, you're like, well, there's a release here at least, you know, like yeah. something I can do from the comfort of my home that doesn't cost me money. I can flip the television on and watch some other people succeed for a while. And then when you get used to it and then it goes the other way, it probably feels like those people, even though they're not the same players who were winning for you five years, they're a completely different group of people. And when it starts going the wrong way, you feel, I guess it comes off like anger, but I just think it's this, it's a sadness that you don't have that release anymore. And we just got so used to it. Yeah. Like it was just one of those things that you just get used to. I mean, you can, you can get used to winning in any regard, right? Like, and then something happens and you're like, wait, what? no, we're, we're winners. Like yeah. we just got used to it. Like, of course we're going to Super Bowl. Of course we're going to win a ring. And I think that, like you said, it was such a release for people. People were feeling very happy. They were getting together and celebrating this thing that wasn't heavy for anybody. Mm-hmm. No, I listen. If this podcast were to ever fall apart, I already know which wall I'm running my head through in this room. So, like, don't worry. Like, it just <laughs> <laughs> because imagine, like, if I lose my job, I don't just lose a job, I lose the way I'm valuable in the world, which I guess also is for most people's jobs. But then I have to make a big shift. And I've been out of like real work, which I'm making with their quotes, but I think I mean, like I've been out of real work for so long. Like, when am I going to go back into the world and go, hi, what have you been doing for the last 10 years? 
Well, for the last 10 years, I was a podcaster, but before that, I wrote a blog. They'll be like, oh, we can't wait to hire you. <laughs> like, 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 what am I? <laughs> uh, can I just sit in the coffee room and talk? People will be so entertained. Yeah, great. That's not a job here. Get the f out. Like, like, so, you know, how am I getting another job? I got to learn to cut somebody's goddamn hair. Like, you know. Yeah, but then even like, if I, am I going to go work for somebody at this point in the game? Like, am I going to go walk into a salon and be like, oh, sure, you can tell me how to do my job and how to book people and when I need to be here. Like, mm -mm, no, thanks. Mostly when I was a kid, I worked in a 7-Eleven for a year. Have I ever talked about this in the podcast? I worked in a 7-Eleven for a year. I don't think I've ever heard you mention 7-Eleven. I don't think I have. Like, yeah. So the long, the short long story is I was really young. Oh my God. My kids are going to listen to this one. I was really young and I had a girlfriend who loved to have sex. I mean, we've been pretty like clear in this episode. She liked to bang one out in the afternoon before she went to her job, just what she enjoyed doing. Okay. And so I literally switched my job so that I could be available at 3 p.m. Priority, Scott. You had priority. I worked in a fucking 7 Eleven for a year because they had a seven to three shift and I could have sex with this lovely girl. <laughs> Every day at 301. Oh, my God, is the best year of my life. I just want to say that out loud right now for <laughs> anyone. And, and I mean, if my kids are listening, I apologize to you. Um, you're probably thinking, what about my birth or when I graduated? And the year I got to have sex every day at four o'clock in the afternoon was the best year of my life. <laughs> and didn't have like real people's problems. Oh, my God. Like, I, had, just... I had enough money, even though I didn't make any money. Yep. I had all the security in the world about where I was going to live and what I was going to eat and everything. And every day there was sex. It was like, it was the greatest thing. Anyway, I had to work in this 7-Eleven from seven to like, it was a terrible job. Why did I start telling this story? <laughs> <laughs> because I said, I don't ever want to work for oh, anybody. Oh, oh, good. By the way, yes, I have a, I have a, I have a, a relation to that. After I worked at that 7-Eleven, and our relationship ran out. Believe it or not, we didn't have a ton in common. Uh, and after that relationship, we, we didn't get out much. So like after we after that relationship ran, of course, I went and did another job for a while. It was a seasonal job. And when that fell apart, I tried to go to a different 7-Eleven because I thought, oh, I'll be able to walk in and grab this job real quick. I know how to do this. And then I'll, I'll keep this job while I'm looking for like the next thing I want to do. Except just working at a different 7-Eleven was so different that I couldn't do it. It was maddening, like all their routines were different and the expectations were different. And you would think it's a 7-Eleven. You do it here, you do it there. It was completely different to me. Right. And, yeah. And that was my point. I actually ended up outing myself on my story about that to tell you that I've gone from one place to another. <laughs> and you really went like all the way through it. I to just get had there. such a lovely, warm remembrance when it came up in my head. <laughs> She's a lovely girl. I'm sure she would be horrified if she, uh, that's why I'm not going to say her name, obviously. Yeah, that's why, yeah. <laughs> but I, what, she was really lovely, and, and I did really enjoy my time with her. And if I'm being clear, I want to say I did love her very much, and I'm sure she didn't like me at all, but that's not the point. <laughs> so um, I think she liked you at least a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> that went on for that long. Yeah. Also, I don't enjoy saying a little bit. Let's say, let's say more than an average <laughs> bit she liked me, okay, Melissa? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> But not okay. an amazing bit, just more than. A <laughs> anyway, so okay. saying she liked you enough probably isn't. An idea. I offered <laughs> enough that she seemed happy. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, that's all. Perfect. Okay, we're done. Let's get past this. Is there anything we haven't talked about that we should have? I can't imagine that there was. <laughs> and I think we've covered a lot. I just, yeah, I wanted to make sure to talk about, you know, just it's, it's a lot. And I think especially as it pertains to work, it's just everyone's just doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. And I'm very thankful for my situation that I'm in because I, again, if I worked for somebody else, I don't know how easy it would be to like pop AirPods in and, you know, check in on what you're doing on the podcast to see if I'm missing anything or check on Anthony and I have alarms going off in the background. And I mean, all to say he's doing awesome and I wouldn't have it any other way, right? Like he had him and my family and everything needs to come first. And, you know, I'm so thankful for what you do and the value that you bring to my family because the one c is great. And now we don't have a lot of panic when we're doing things. We're like, oh, we've seen this before. We don't need to run around with our hair caught on fire. And I'm just super thankful that if he had to get diabetes, we got it at this point in time. Well, that's very nice I, I um, for you to say about, about what I'm doing. And I think it's a great perspective that you have, actually. But can I ask you, what is it I do? Do I just... 
effortlessly weave good information about diabetes around stories about having sex as a young, as a, as a 19 year old. Is it that- is like you took the words right out of my mouth because that is the way I would have so eloquently put it. <laughs> I, I, I'm honestly, there are times I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Like why? It, li- listen, this is not me blowing a, a horn for myself or anything like that, but I am ultra aware of the podcasting space. Like I pay attention to it in a way that may be unhealthy. So let me tell you, let me tell you what it is because Go ahead. I happened upon your podcast in the hospital on like day two. I just was sitting there and he was sleeping and I was like, I don't know anything about, about diabetes. Like I don't even know where to start. And when they came in and they dosed him with insulin and they were telling us he was going to start to give himself injections. And I said, okay, you know, they give you the hospital menu and it has all the carb counts. And they said, figure it out. We had to do the math equation. And they said, so we'll do this 20 minutes before he eats. And I looked at them and I said, I do not understand because what if he doesn't eat everything on his plate? Wouldn't it make more sense to dose him after? Mm-hmm. Now, understand we're in the children's floor of the hospital. I have endocrine coming in and out. I have all the nutrition coming in and out. Nobody said to me, it takes about X amount of time for insulin to come online. So here I am asking this very specific question. Why wouldn't it make more sense to do it after when I know what he's eating? And they said, yeah, you can do that, but you should do it this way. Nobody told me the why. So your podcast is so valuable because you're telling me somebody who's very black and white, very type A, the why. So I can make it make sense in my brain. Here's what we need to do. We're eating this food. It's going to hit like that. We need to pre bolus like this. Okay. And that is even as I, we went to the doctor, you know, where we go every three months and once a year we do diabetes clinic and we're in clinic for like three hours. So his last appointment was actually November 15th and we went in and the nurse practitioner, and I like everybody in the practice, I really do. But the nurse practitioner said to me, hey, you had diabetes clinic in August. Do you like it? And I'm one of these people that I believe you can say anything to anybody if you're respectful, right? Like mm-hmm. if you're not an asshole, you can say whatever you need to say. And I said, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't appreciate diabetes clinic. And she said, why? And I said, well, for us specifically, because we always hear you're our star patient. You don't need to worry so much. And I love that they see me that way, but I don't appreciate it because I had to go get this information somewhere else. And it doesn't mean that I'm okay with this 250 blood sugar that I'm seeing. And I'm trying to get ratios right. And if they say to me, you are a star patient. Don't worry about it so much. That's neither here nor there to me. That makes me feel sad for other patients yeah. that they don't have the information or the education or whatever. So I said to her, I don't appreciate diabetes clinic because nutrition comes in and they say to me, you know, whatever they're saying to me about food. And if I ask them a specific insulin dosing strategy for a specific food and they look at me and say, I don't know, you've wasted my time. I don't, I, if I have specific questions that you consistently cannot answer, I don't want to sit here for three hours. Right. Psychology comes in. I think psychology is super important. He saw somebody right after diagnosis that was not a good fit for him. And we said, this woman's not a good fit for him. She was perfectly lovely. She just wasn't a good fit for Anthony. Mm-hmm. They, and the practice said, nope, we think that they are the best fit. So why do I have to do this thing if you're going to make me do it when you won't meet my need? So what you were able to do is give me, number one, the information that I was searching for that nobody else seemed to be able to give me because this is not my body, right? So I can't go experimenting with insulin because it's not my body. I, I need to be respectful of him. I don't know what's going to happen. He's not always with me. So you were able to give me the confidence to be able to do the things that I need to do to keep him healthy. I need to be able to set him up so that when he is a grown up and says to me, I don't want you following my numbers or I'm not with him all the time that he has the confidence to move forward. And that is something that we weren't ever going to be able to get just from the practice. I understand I could hire a CDE. I could hire someone like Jenny, who I am obsessed with. I love her so much, but that's what you do. That's what you're able to do for people. And it is invaluable. I appreciate you. Honestly, I I honestly appreciate you sharing that with me because I know I've said it before, but I'm almost the last person who understands exactly what is happening. Like I'm just being myself. And I have this information and do you know what I mean? Like somebody didn't sit down and say, do this, then say this and be like that. And then this lady will have that experience. I'm just doing the thing and it happened to work out. I mean, it genuinely. And what I was going to say earlier was that when you look at what is popular in podcasting, uh, especially around health, 
when you look at what's popular in podcasting around health, what you see mostly is like the bro science stuff, you know, like stuff that mm. may help, but like who really knows if it's, you know, does getting in a freezing cold bathtub make your life better? Like, I don't know, but it's a very popular thing to talk about right now. And if you talk about that on your podcast, you will have a popular podcast. If you, you know, uh, double down on like ketogenic diets, you'll have a popular podcast. If you take a position on a certain, you know, like thing, you'll have, you'll have a popular podcast. But the idea of talking about diabetes, there are other people doing it and not just podcasting, but also blogs, Instagram influencers, TikTokers, like all these, like every, let's be honest, people are trying to be internet famous with the thing they have. Right. Mm -hmm. And there are some, there are also people trying to help. Like I'm not discounting that, but there's a lot of people out there trying to make a living off of whatever this is. And it doesn't work only for this show. That's the only one who like, I'm consistently in the top 20 in the Apple podcast medicine chart for like four and a half or five years now. I know you're not a podcaster, but that's insane. Like it's absolutely insane. It's a niche idea. That's like, when I pull up the top 10, you know, right, I'm looking at the top 10 right now. If I said Peter Atia to you, do you know who that is? Nope. No, because you care about diabetes. But trust me, right. a lot of people who are into podcasts and go, oh, I know Peter Atia. If I said Dr. Mark Heyman, you'd go, I know Dr. Mark Heyman. Does anyone know Rhonda Patrick? People love her. How do they know her? She had this podcast. She went on Joe Rogan's podcast. He made her super huge. She's been in the top five in my category for years since she was on Rogan. Like. There are millions of people listening to these podcasts. Paul Saladino doubles down on, I think, carnivore diet. He stays in the top 10 doing that. RFK does the, the what he's coming, what's his perspective about, like, you know, questioning vaccines. He stays in that high space all the time. Like, that's the kind of, like, hot button stuff you have to do to have a top 10 podcast. Unless you're me talking about type 1 diabetes and when you worked at 7-Eleven. <laughs> For some reason, that mix works. Like, like the ADA has a podcast. It does not do well. I would guarantee. I mean, listen, I've never heard it. I genuinely, I, want, I have my right hand raised like I'm in court. I've never heard the ADA's podcast, okay? But I bet you it's got good information in it. But nobody listens to it. I think one of the biggest mistakes people make in the diabetes space is they just sit back and go, we're delivering good information. People should get it. They'll come get it. And that's not how it works. I also think for you specifically, how you structure the podcast, you know, you have the pro tip series and then you have all the other specific informational series. But the conversation, one of the things I think that is really lacking in type 1 diabetes is community. And the Facebook page is the best, but in real life. Yeah. You don't have this community. So like my family will say to me, how's Anthony? And it depends on the day. Some days I want to be like, his basal rates were off and this and that and this and that. And all they wanted to hear was good. Yeah. You know, like they, they don't, of course, don't want anything wrong with him, but they're not looking for me to, because it's not something that they've had to know about. You don't know about diabetes and so you have to know about diabetes. So in these conversations, in this space, I may not be able to talk back. I mean, I do in my car, especially like when I'm hearing, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally know what you're talking about. It provides a sense of community that people can listen to people share their stories and not just online because we all know in a Facebook group, like I posted something recently about cheese sticks. My son fell out of honeymoon in like a moment and he would eat like three cheese sticks, which were typically like a no insulin snack. Yeah. And hours later, he would be high, and I couldn't figure out why. And all of a sudden, it hit me like a freight train, like it was the cheese sticks. He's having three cheese sticks at a time. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, I posted it on the Facebook page. And if somebody, you know, somebody was like, "You need to allow him to have cheese sticks," and that's not necessarily the community I'm, you know, that when you're in this space, you're just looking for someone yeah. to share with and understand where you're coming from. Yep. And I think it's hard online, but it's something easier about hearing people's voices and hearing them be vulnerable in a podcast and laugh with you. And so you do get that sense of community yep. that we, you know, you, you might see, like, I like when people say like a T1D in the wild and mm -hmm. I, we might get that, but there isn't that big sense of community in day-to-day -day normal life. So these conversations are so important because even if today we've talked about like a million different things, but if there's one thing that we've talked about and someone's like, I, that resonates with me and 
that was helpful to me, then that sort of makes you feel so much better yeah. within your community. Listen, I'm going to give up my secret on this, which I've said on the podcast over and over again. You have to allow people to communicate openly and be themselves and not stifle people because they say something that you're worried someone else is going to be uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't hurt that I'm this way on the podcast and this is how I am. And so I'm like that in the Facebook group, too. And so people who listen to the podcast who make it to the Facebook group are also communicative, open people like honest so that when somebody comes in and tries to shut you down or shame you for saying something that they think, you know, is not politically correct or whatever. I know, by the way, woke means politically correct, right? Isn't it the same thing? And so like, you can't keep changing the words. I'm old. I need to be able to keep up, but uh, to give you an, to give you an example, two days ago in the Facebook group, someone posted a picture of their kid with a deer. They just shot like, you know, when hunters like kill something and they take a picture with it. Right. And I'm not a hunter. I've never shot a gun. By the way, my wife asked me what I want for Christmas. And I was like, I might want like range lessons. Like maybe I'd like to learn to shoot a gun like in a controlled. Anyway, I've never shot a gun. I've never held a gun. I've never gone hunting. If you asked me to kill something so that I could eat, I probably could do it. But I wouldn't do it with a lot of zest or gusto. This is my position on this. But I don't take down this. This person's excited. Like in their Mm -hmm. world, hunting's a big deal. And they're proud of their kid. And people started reporting that post, like not a lot because I've cultivated a space where everybody's safe. Right. But but Mm -hmm. I got four or five people reporting the posts. And and then finally someone posted in there and said, you know, I don't need to see this person like like I don't. And I just I deleted their comment and I sent them a note and I said, be nice. This person is very proud of their child. You might not be into hunting. They are. Let it go. When one of my moderators asked me, what do you think of the hunting post? I said. In my mind, that's no different than someone's kid holding a soccer trophy. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they're just like, look, my kid did a thing. Like, it's a thing we've been working on for a long time. It's a thing that our family thinks is important. And I'm proud. Do I know there are going to be some people who complain about this? I do. But I don't care. Like, it's not that I don't care that you're upset about it. My my position is don't look at it. Yeah, you could, you, you could. And I know it's like a hard concept. You could just keep scrolling. Yeah. Yeah. You could just say, this doesn't interest me. I don't need to look at it and I can just move about my day. Again, now I could use more buds words like this and have a more popular podcast, but it's virtue signaling. It's you wanting to make sure that the whole world understands that you think this is wrong and you're on the right side of it. And so mm-hmm. like take it out of the hunting thing for a minute and go into simpler things that doesn't exist in my space. And if it does, we take care of it immediately and not privately. You will like I will respond to somebody and say, look, I don't know what's going on here, but we're not going to talk to people like that. Mm -hmm. Like and we're not going to DM each other and and be private about it. You said something crappy. Take it back or live in the honesty of what happened here. Like you're, you're getting called out for this. And it's not mean or cruel. It's actually done very kindly. But it's it's about like expression and open communication and allowing everybody to be who they are. And at its core saying, like, we we all have this thing in common. Like, we're, you know, you, there's diabetes in your family. Like, like that That's it. And I don't care type 1 or type 2 or lot or it doesn't matter to me. Like, you have diabetes or you love someone with diabetes or you're supporting somebody with diabetes. You're welcome in that space. We're not going to be all woke. We're not going to delete things because we don't like when people say stuff that makes us uncomfortable. Like, and we're also not going to let people make other people uncomfortable on purpose. Like it's an easy balance if you just apply common sense to it while you're looking at it instead of being worried all the time that someone's going to cancel you or like you can't get canceled. You live in Iowa. You know what I mean? Like you're you're just you're okay. You're posting online about something. It's your kids, whatever. Like, don't worry. You're not you're not famous. (laughs) And by the way, and I I also. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I also think that diabetes is is hard and it's a lot. And it's like, even from Anthony's diagnosis story, like I still get very emotional. And so I also think that where people in your life don't know as much as you do, right. Cause again, you don't know what you don't know, but it, you, you get to have people when you're in the Facebook group, most people are well-intended and it's like other people rooting for you. They want you to, you know, if I say Anthony's A1C, you know, he was like almost 14 at diagnosis where we've been consistently between like five, eight and six, one, like my, my, family is like that's great but they don't know and so it's it's really other people getting to cheer you on which is just so valuable because not that you need validation from other people but 
this diabetes, what we know about diabetes is what I forget the statistic, but diabetics have to make like X amount more decisions a day than everybody else. And it's just somebody else who knows what you're going through and is able to cheer you on in the background. I'll tell you what, it's another little thing that I was way out ahead of that I can look back in hindsight and tell you I was 100% correct about that because yep. because the like celebrating success I mean I've been in this space a long time so back when I was blogging it was frowned upon like it was looked at as rubbing it in people's faces that you're doing better than them I never once saw somebody rubbing something in someone's face I'm like that's not what they're doing that's how you're choosing to take it and so when people succeed in my Facebook group, I'm like, tell us, like, you know, you want to put your A1C up there, your time and range, or you want to show us a great bolus that worked out for you, like do that because other people either can, you know, it sprouts a conversation where people can learn what you did. Or by the way, I think most importantly, it expresses hope. Like, so if you're doing poorly, you can look up and go, there's some lady from Minnesota figured this out by listening to a stupid podcast. Like maybe I'll go listen to that podcast. Maybe I'll figure it out. Like maybe I'll be hopeful instead of just like, oh gosh, this is never going to go my way. Don't rub it in. No one's rubbing it in. You know how they feel. They're elated that they got got something right and that they might be onto and, something. And they have to go somewhere where they can be celebrated within their community on top of the fact that I think what you just said is really important. Like what's that saying? Like there's more than one way to skin a cat. And so when you see the comments and you're like, well, I've tried this and I've tried that, maybe not everything is for everybody in every situation. Right. So if I see things, I'm like, oh, I need to make a mental note of that. So when we do this thing, this person had great success this way. Yeah, I think it's important to have those resources because you can read all the books you want, but when things are happening in real time, I think it's helpful to be part of. Right. Yeah. And by the way, did you say there's more than one way to skin a cat because we were talking about hunting earlier or was that unattached to that? I'm just well, no, I mean, it fits well. But you live in Boston. One of those, those, you, you, <laughs> you don't know anybody saying. shooting animals in Boston. They're shooting people. Oh, no, right I there. do. Actually, oh, do it's you? funny Hunters? that you said that because this past Saturday, I went to a new friend's house. She's a volleyball mom for my daughter's volleyball team. And we went over there to do, put the gifts for the banquet together. And I opened the door. She's like, listen, I have a lot of taxidermy on my wall. Are you freaked out? I'm like, no, it's fine. And she had... <laughs> taxidermy all over the walls that her husband had hunted and killed. They're just rats from the city or they, he goes into the woods. I'm just teasing. Um, uh, <laughs> a few were the Boston rats. No, uh, he had like, yeah, I think he had like a black bear. I think he had all kinds of stuff. Jeez. Wow. That's braver. Yeah. I, gun or no gun. That's braver than I could be. <laughs> In the end, the whole thing works and it works because it's authentic. It works because I don't sit around worrying if somebody's going to not like it. Like, trust me, I'm going to get an email saying, you shouldn't have said you and your girlfriend, she liked to bang one out after <laughs> he was a freshman in college. But but like, you know, what I mean, like I'm going to get a note that says you shouldn't have said you and your girlfriend like to bang one out when she was done with school. Like I'm somebody's going to say that someone's going to call me a misogynist. Trust me, I'm going to get like you don't love women like I'm going to get all that kind of like fringe opinion. Does that make sense? Like whether it's like far yeah. right or far left like fringe opinions, like people who are like, they're virtue signaling. They want to let you know, they know the way the world's supposed to go. You're doing it wrong. I get notes all the time that would freak you out. Not one of them stops me from saying, I know that the podcast and the way I make it helps people live better with their diabetes. So I'm going to keep doing that. Like that's, yeah. that's it. I'm just going to keep doing that. But when COVID started, as an example, when COVID started, there was this news story I don't remember the details of, but it was out of like Sweden, maybe. And I thought it was interesting. And I think I just posted it somewhere. I was like, this is interesting. And and I don't know anything about it. I just thought maybe people would find it interesting. I, I genuinely don't even remember what it was about. I'm being 100% honest. Well, like a day later on some social media platform, this guy's literally trying to cancel me. He's like, this podcast, you shouldn't listen to it anymore. This guy's like, I forget what he said I was doing. And, and I was like, I'm like, dude, I'm just... Like when I looked at it, I thought, I'm just sharing this news article, like do whatever you want with it. Like, I don't give a crap, but I had gone against his orthodoxy. And because of that, he was now going to try to ruin my life and ruin this podcast. He didn't care how many people the podcast helped. That wasn't important anymore. He was out there trying to show everybody how virtuous he was. And you know what I did? Nothing. I didn't do a goddamn yep, thing. Nothing. Yeah, I didn't reach out to him. I didn't try to explain myself. I didn't get upset. I didn't run around wringing my hands going like, oh, God, it's mm -hmm. over. I just said, 
this is meaningless. This person's wrong and I'm not going to engage with them. And it all went away in a day, but it was his intention, it's, you know? It's almost unfathomable to me because it just, as, as my 16 year old says, it's just not that deep. Like she says to me all the time, mom, it's just not that deep. Yeah. Like I can't imagine my world on any given moment is like a dumpster fire at best. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine focusing so much on so what someone else does if they have a different opinion or say something I don't like. I can't imagine doing anything other than moving on. Yeah, I don't get how everybody wants to have a hot take about things that are so complicated that they don't understand them and nobody else does either. Like that's that's always and if you don't agree with their hot take, then you're a bad person. You're trying to ruin the world. Or, you know, it's vice wild. versa. I had somebody reach out to me recently and wanted me to do an episode about the, you know, the current conflict in uh, between Israel and I guess, am I saying this right? Is it between Israel and Hamas? I'm not even sure. Yeah. I, I don't yeah, understand that. I don't understand it enough to speak well on it. But all I could think was, so you want me to take my diabetes podcast that helps everyone with diabetes and alienate half of the people listening so that they leave and don't get help with their diabetes anymore so that I can share your opinion about what's happening overseas, a place where you're not at and don't know anything about. I'm like, yeah. immediately. No, immediately can't even consider like, what are people thinking? Like, does he not want you to be successful? Also, I don't have an opinion about it because I've never been there. I Correct. don't live there. I'm not Palestinian. I'm not Israeli. I don't know anybody who is. You want me involved in this? I was like, it's a diabetes podcast. Like, why in God's <laughs> name would I be involved in this? And so you know what ended up happening is now that person's mad at me. People are always mad at me. Melissa, I have a saying that I, uh, that I, I share with Isabel all the time. And uh, she's the only person I've ever said this to. So now I'm saying it to everybody. I say, don't worry. Eventually, in the end, I'll be the bad guy. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> everyone's going to blame me on the last day. It, it's, it's just the position you're in by doing this thing. And again, I wish that wasn't the case. It breaks my heart when people get mad at something else and decide I'm the one who did it to them because I'm a voice in their headphones. Then I, they, I feel famous to them. I'm not famous. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm not important. I don't. I'm no more important than anybody else, but eventually they'll focus on me and decide that I'm, I'm the problem. And it doesn't happen a lot, but when it happens, it's, I, I find it tragic because I'm like, Oh God, like, are, are you this lost? I'm a disembodied voice in your ears. Like I'm, I'm not really a part of your life. You know, like I'm not impacting you, but some people are, you know, unstable to some degree. And or, or really struggling and that happens. But again, when that happens, I have a lot of compassion for it, but big picture, the podcast helps a lot of people. I don't waver. I stay course, you know? So, and I think that that's super important. And the tragedy is like they're, they need, they need more help, help than yeah. what you could even offer. I've tried. It's a number of times I've been successful with some people and, but most of the time it just, I just end up being the bad guy. And eventually it we it all weeds itself out because you're going to attract the people like all the other people in the community from the Facebook group and the podcast. And it's just going to weed itself out. It's just unfortunate that you're like taking shrapnel dealing with it. If you do what I do and you want to be successful at it and actually help people, then the phrase, I can't help everybody has to be part of how you think about this. Like I'm going to do my best yeah. to help everybody. I'm not going to intersect well with some people those people are going to go their own way. And this is not my failing. And it's certainly not an indication of who they are. It's just, we're not a good fit. Like you talked about with a therapist or with your ex-husband or anything like that. We're just not a good fit together. And we always learned that you cannot be all things to all people. Yeah. No, and I mean, so sometimes it just doesn't work out. I tried in the beginning. It made me crazy. So like, and, and by tried it, I mean, it was my intention, but that's where all the like the strife online comes from. And by the way, it's where you get milk toast content from. I'm not going to call anybody out, but from a, a large portion of this space is that what you're doing is really well intended, sometimes very well educated people are trying to be liked by everyone. Mm -hmm. When you make yourself that boring or Milk toast is the right word. I just don't know if people know it. Like when you make yourself that bland so that nobody can have a problem with you, 
then you are not going to be able to properly deliver content to people in a way that's valuable to them. Like, you know, when, you know, when you flip through TikTok or Instagram and somebody pops up in front of you and they're like, hi, I have great advice for how to exercise with diet. Like, I, do they just realize that people can't flick away from that fast enough? <laughs> like, Not they, fast they, enough. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, please don't screw up my algorithm. I got to get rid of this. And by the way, who knows what they were going to say next? Probably really terrific advice. But you seem like a fake person when you're doing that. You, you know, like, and, and you don't just seem fake to, you know, very conservative people. You don't just seem fake to very like liberal people. You don't just seem fake. You seem fake to everybody because you are being fake because you're not being yourself. You're trying to be palatable to everyone. It doesn't work. So, and I think that that's a really, you know, important part of the podcast in the conversations that you have with, I'm going to say random because I'm a random person from the Facebook, but it's like a random person like me is that everybody's being there. Uh, you're giving them space to be their authentic self so that they maybe have something in common with someone else that's going to hear them and think, oh, I needed that. Yeah. We need to hear everybody's perspective, like everybody's. Yeah. And uh, anyway, you're terrific. Uh, we've established I'm fantastic. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to, um, I'm calling this episode Juicy Jaw. I just want to remind oh, everybody man. it's about the thing <laughs> Melissa said. Not about the thing I said about 7-Eleven. Okay, so. <laughs> and I will say now when you get that feeling and something is like either grosses you up, like I can't do blood, I can't do the side of any of that. And if you feel the kind of way and you realize that your back molars are starting to water, you're going to be like, that's juicy jaw. <laughs> that's what that is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Melissa. <laughs> I appreciate it. Oh. Thank you, Scott. Oh, my pleasure. Hold on one second. I want to thank the Eversense CGM for sponsoring this episode of the Juice Box Podcast and invite you to go to eversensecgm.com slash juicebox to learn more about this terrific device. You can head over now and just absorb everything that the website has to offer, and that way you'll know if Eversense feels right for you. eversensecgm.com slash juicebox. Mark is an incredible example of what so many experience living with diabetes. You show up for yourself and others every day, never letting diabetes define you. And that is what the Medtronic Champion community is all about. Each of us is strong, and together, we're even stronger. To hear more stories from the Medtronic Champion community, or to share your own story, visit MedtronicDiabetes.com slash juicebox. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G V O K E G L U C A G O N dot com forward slash juice box. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back soon with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. The episode you just heard was professionally edited by Wrong Way Recording, wrongwayrecording.com.